Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about conservation biology, and in particular, biodiversity. If you recall, biodiversity could be measured on a genetic level within a species. It could be species diversity, and it could also be the whole ecosystem. And so I'm going to talk to you today about uh, three case studies in particular just to really provide some sound evidence and support of the fact that biodiversity is absolutely crucial to preserve and protect. And what could be more important than driving the point home as it relates to human welfare? And in particular, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about medicine and how biodiversity is important in terms of discovering and preserving medicine for uh, treatment. <laughs> and so uh, why should we care about biodiversity? Well, it's, it's beneficial because, again, human health is related to biodiversity of species that you wouldn't think otherwise. And so we have really no choice to protect biodiversity because in the end, we depend upon it. And so one of the first uh, case studies that I want to talk about is the polar bear. Now, everybody loves the polar bear. It's kind of iconic, and it's actually the symbol, one of the symbols of conservation groups because it's so, so adorable. And so one of the things about the polar bear is that, you know, they're magnificent creatures. They're the largest uh, land carnivore in the world. And we have something related to them because they basically evolved at around the same time we did around 200,000 years ago. And so what's really, really sad about this is that it's predicted, are you ready for polar bears are predicted to become extinct by the end of this century, at least in the wild, perhaps not in captivity, but it's brutal. And one of the main reasons why it, it's thought to be going extinct is that its habitat is really being altered. And so the ice sheets that it lives on in the Arctic are melting due to global warming and temperature increases. And so what happens is it's affecting the polar bear's ability to eat its favorite food, which is seals. And so when the seals come up, the polar bear has a difficult time catching them. Um, the seals come up and they evade capture when the ice isn't present. And so as a result, the bears are, are literally starving. It's pretty brutal. So the, these bears are given iconic uh, symbols of, of conservation. But what I wanna to talk to you about is some of their implications in terms of how they could affect human medical conditions. And so they have medical value and that's rarely mentioned. And so one of the things about a polar bear being that it's a bear, like most bears, they hibernate like a black bear hibernates. For example, they, they go to sleep for a long period of time with their cubs and they're essentially immobile for several months at a time, five, seven months at a time, but yet they don't get osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is literally what it means. It's porous bone. So it's the thinning of the bone. And every mammal is going to get this uh, as a result of being immobile. And it's really a, a concern that we have for humans as we age, uh, that our bones become more brittle and they're, they're vulnerable to fracture. We're even concerned about long-term travel in space because of the fact gravity pushes down on us and it forces our bones to work a little bit harder in space with less gravity, our bones become more brittle and osteoporosis uh, sets in. And so as it turns out, um, we lose about a third of our bone if we were bedridden for five months. So this is a real serious issue. And so all the time our bones are either forming strong bone or breaking down bone. And so as it turns out, this is sort of a dynamic process. But if there's no load being put on the bone, if there's no exercise, then the equilibrium sort of shifts to a, a reabsorption of the bone and it becomes porous. And as I was saying, this is real serious because it results in potentially problems like fractured hips, which can kill up to 70,000 people a year. And so every mammal loses bone mass during prolonged immor immotility, except for hibernating bears do not. Now, why is that? What's up with the bear? Like, what is it about the bear that maintains bone density even when it's hibernating? Well, the United States, again, this is like validating why 
this is important. The United States economy spends $18 billion a year on, on osteoporosis and related bone injuries and things like this. And so hibernating bears could have substances, they probably do, that may prevent this. Right now, this is an untreatable disease, and so we need to be able to investigate this. And so in addition to osteoporosis, think about this. Hibernating bears, they don't eat. They're not drinking, they're not urinating, and they're not pooping for several months. And so what? So they don't drink, yet they don't become dehydrated. They don't eat, yet they don't starve. They don't get rid of their urinary waste, but yet they don't become ill. And so they're kind of like black belts of recycling in the animal world. And so they recycle everything. So if we don't urinate for just a few days, then we'll die as a result of that. And so as it turns out, we have problems with our urinary system. We have no treatment for uh, end-stage renal disease other than kidney dialysis, where you have to hook your body up to a machine and your blood is filtered, and, which removes the nit nitrogenous waste, or you need to get a, a kidney transplant. But bears, somehow, this is a bladder, this is the urethra, these are the ureters connecting to the kidneys. Somehow, the bear is able to reabsorb its urinary waste from the bladder and therefore break that down and how about this make new amino acids and new proteins from that and so it's able to recycle that we would love to figure out how they do that and so no one understands this but yet the bear holds the secret to treating uh, end-stage renal disease which kills 80,000 Americans at a cost of 27 billion dollars a year so I hope that's getting your attention and so also one last note on the polar bear is that you know, finally, it becomes massively obese um, right before it hibernates. So it eats and eats and eats. And, and for humans, obesity is linked to type 2 diabetes in which we, when, when humans become obese, there's a connection there between that. And so as it turns out, diabetes is becoming epidemic as well. And it's involving 16 million uh, people, 5% of the population. It kills a quarter of a million Americans per year, diabetes. And so, again, the, these sort of denning bears, these polar bears, might contain the secret to avoiding type 2 diabetes uh, with obesity. But they have to be studied, and they have to be studied in the wild, and they have to be preserved. The second case study that I'd like to discuss is Lyme disease. Now, Lyme disease is caused by bacteria uh, and it's really an important thing because it's infectious. And so uh, here's a map in the United States where the incidence of Lyme disease, this is kind of um, not so good for the East Coast. <laughs> this is where Lyme disease is most prevalent. But as you can see, these little blue dots are kind of everywhere. And so as it, as it turns out, um, it's uh, the most common vector-borne disease in the U.S. And what we mean by vector, it means that there's, there's some sort of organism that's uh, the link between the bacteria and transmitting it to a human. So there's something that's vectoring it. And so as it turns out, ticks happen to be the vector for transmitting Lyme disease to people. And so as it turns out, if you get bit by a tick that has Lyme disease, sometimes you develop this sort of... Um, bullseye rash and that's that's a very scary thing but really um, not everyone gets that and so sometimes you know these ticks are kind of scary because they're small you don't even know you're getting bit but if you left uh, Lyme disease untreated like say for example you get a tick bite and you didn't even know it, it could, you'll eventually become ill and you could die as a result of Lyme disease and so it was noted through really cool observation. That's one of the things about science is that sometimes we just use our, our observational skills and we, and we pick something up and then we sort of hypothesize on what might be happening. It's kind of cool. So it was noticed that in areas of the country where there's low level vertebrate diversity, so no, not a lot of species, vertebrate diversity, there is a higher incident of Lyme disease. Hmm. Interesting. So that's that's kind of a kind of a mystery. And so some field studies were done to try to sort of understand what's happening with diversity 
and again, biodiversity, diversity and Lyme disease. So this is what we have. So th this is the tick. So the tick, it's kind of uh, like an omnivore. It'll pretty much eat anything it, 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 that crosses its path. It, it's, uh, it's not really discriminating. And so it'll bite a mouse, it'll squirrel, it'll bite us, it'll bite a dog, it'll bite a cat, it'll bite reptiles, birds, it's, it's, it's out of control. So as it turns out, when the, the tick bites, most of these animals that it bites are called incompetent hosts. And, and an incompetent host is something that is not going to transmit, it's not going to be a good reservoir of the bacteria, and so it's not going to pass it on very much. And so we're, we're an example of that. We're kind of like a dead-end host. So if the tick bites us, other ticks that, that bite us aren't going to get the bacteria and pass it on. So in other words, you know, that's it when, when, it, when it bites us. And so there's some pictures of ticks. Um, this deer tick's kind of small. Like the, the ones that infect dogs that maybe you're, you're most familiar with, you can kind of see them. Sometimes they swell up when they've been sucking your blood, they're parasites. <laughs> Sometimes they're really small. It's hard to know if you have this. You gotta check. And so as it turns out, um, the organism that is the best competent host for the tick happens to be this little cute guy called the white-footed mouse, but it's trouble. Because when the, when the um, tick bites it, it's able to put the bacteria in here. And so the bacteria are circulating in the blood of this mouse, white-footed mouse. And so when other little tiny ticks bite this, they can transmit the disease really well. And so it's a real competent host. And so the bacteria that causes Lyme disease can replicate really well in that mouse. So as it turns out, it's the main reservoir that passes the, ba the bacteria uh, to immature ticks. And so that it spreads basically. So more, more of these white footed mouse and it's trouble. And so this is the, this is the point that I want to make. And so, you know, well, what are we going to do about it? Well, they live, these mice live in the forest. And so the tick bites it and it passes it on to another organism. So most organisms, as I was saying before, most animals that the tick bites are incompetent. And so as it turns out, now think about this, if most of the uh, animals that the tick bites are incompetent, then if you have a lot of diversity of animals, the tick is kind of, the is biting all of these animals, but it, they're sort of like dead ends. And so it's less likely to get the mouse if there's more other things to, for the tick to be biting. Okay, do you follow that? And so as it turns out, so the more diversity of animals, or really anything, birds in here, anything, the more diversity means that, and, and diversity has to do with the fact that the forest needs to be intact. So if you start logging down the forest, then you're going to re reduce the diversity. And so the more diversity, the less risk that we have of getting Lyme disease, which is a killer. And again, this is called the dilution effect. So it's getting more and more diluted the more diversity there is. And it's a big deal in infectious diseases and oncology. And so it, this applies to other diseases as well, not just Lyme disease. And so as it turns out, you know, there's other mechanisms at play here. So if there's a lot of diversity in the forest, you know, so not only are there a lot of dead ends because they're not, they're not good vectors, but it turns out that there's competitors for the mouse and there's also predators. So if there's more diversity, there's more competition against the mouse. So the mouse doesn't do very well. And there's predators. You, you put competitors for the mouse and then predators like, for example, like a fox, if there's a lot of fox in the wood, that's going to eat up all these guys. And if there's bobcats, it's going to eat up all these m m mice. And eagles and weasels and snakes, they just like devour these, these mice. This is all very good. Less m mice and then less Lyme disease. So they eat them up like chocolates. <laughs> and so this is a way to keep the population of, of mice down. These are regulatory things, competition and predation. But without these organisms, then the mouse runs amok. And so with the population down, uh, the most common is the best 
competent host. And so Lyme disease goes up as a result of this. And so we have to keep biodiversity strong in order to keep Lyme disease down. And so finally, the third and last case study is sort of the, one of the most unusual things you've ever heard of is there's this organism called the gastric brooding frog. And okay, let's break that down. So gastric means stomach. Brooding is to sort of grow children. So in other words, children are growing in the stomach of frogs. And so there's two species of gastric brooding frogs that were discovered in the rainforests of Australia. Okay. And so as it turns out, what happens is the females will swallow the eggs and they'll, and they'll actually develop in the stomach. And so they'll actually hatch in there. So tadpoles will hatch in there and then they'll reach a sort of a, a stage of their development where a little tiny frog is then vomited up <laughs> to the outside. Here's a picture here. And so how about that? And this happens over and over again. And so it's a gastric uh, brooding frog. And so here's another picture of the, the frog being like released to the outside. Talk about a frog in your throat. <laughs> Sorry about that. So <laughs> all these vertebrates, uh, including amphibians, including us, produce substances in, in the stomach. Okay, let's talk about the stomach for a little bit. The stomach is a digestive organ. And so uh, it basically, it's very acidic. And so it also secretes a, a very potent enzyme called pepsin, which breaks down protein, which helps to not only break down protein, but defend against uh, bacteria that we're eating. And so something's going on because how in the world can these frogs the baby ones survive in the stomach. It's not really a, a, a great place to grow. And so it was discovered, not surprisingly, that the eggs must be in the tadpoles, must be releasing a substance that prevents them from being digested. So it must somehow uh, neutralize acid. It might do something with the, the enzyme pepsin. It's, it's somewhat mysterious. But of course, scientists are really interested in this. Why? because people can get peptic ulcer disease. And so this is a, a real common di disorder in the United States. 25 million Americans will get peptic ulcer disease. And so as it turns out, physicians and researchers were trying to analyze the substances to find out how they work, but the research had to stop. And you're like, well, why did it have to stop? Because it turns out that these two species of gastric brooding frogs that were found nowhere else in the whole world except for that rainforest went extinct. So why is that? Uh, it's probably, we believe, the destruction of their, their stream where they lived and their forest habitat was destroyed. And, and, and in some cases, they may have gotten a fungal infection, which the fungus was not normally found in, the, in this rainforest, except for the fact that it's getting warmer because of climate change. And so these miraculous chemicals that have been evolving for millions of years in the gastric brooding frog that may work differently from any other chemical that we're familiar with by inhibiting enzymes uh, and may be the key to solving uh, a mystery and saving so many lives is gone forever because the animal is extinct. Now think about that. Thanks for watching.